about food supplies. We've talked about mm -hmm. water, so clearly mm -hmm. there's an implication for our food supplies. So let's talk mm -hmm. about that, too. We will get to hope, I, I promise. Yeah. Um, so our food supplies are being stressed partly by climate change. There, there's a demand issue here, coming back to this issue of supply and demand. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've been riding this amazing you know, um, escalator called the, the, uh, that was, that's based on our ability to produce fertilizer. Mm -hmm. And part of that's based on our ability to deliver phosphorus to crops that desperately needed it to grow. We're going to run out of easy phosphorus by the middle of this century. So that's going to be a big issue with regards to fertilizer. That's going to have an impact on our ability to produce food to sustain you know, the world's population at that time. At the same time, and again, we're going to come back to hope, I promise, but we are going to be, we, we know now based on enough information, there uh, enough information that heating crops up tends to lower their productivity. This is now being worked on a lot. We are supplying with them with more carbon dioxide, which is, acts as a natural fertilizer, but we're stressing them as well. And, the, um, and we've got to get, deliver water to them. And the, uh, one of the places actually that's facing a bigger challenge than California is the breadbasket. The breadbasket has been drawing on pretty much a single source bank, which is aquifers that have been in place there for tens of millions of years. And they're drawing on them fast enough that they're causing measurable uh, changes in the height of the earth that we can measure from space, uh, thanks to the rate at which they're drawing on that water bank. So we're going to have to come to terms to that. And again, I th there are solutions, but we're going to have to face them squarely and have an adult conversation about them. Okay. So from land to air, uh, mm -hmm. when, we, when we see really horrible pictures of the air, air pollution from around the world, mm -hmm. uh, we tend to emphasize carbon. But what we haven't discussed so far is something called the short-lived climate pollutants, mm -hmm. the soot, soot and methane. Let's concentrate on those. Sure. So uh, how, how big a problem is black carbon or soot? And then I mm -hmm. will talk about methane a little separately in just in a second. So <clears throat> soot is a... Um, is really a bad actor in multiple ways. It is a major uh, cause of respiratory disease. Mm -hmm. And the, a report was just issued at the American Association of, uh, for the Advancement of Science meeting that was held in February that estimated that 5 million people died in one year due to these short-lived climate pollutants. So this is, a, this is a serious human health issue. And so does a major actor there. Soot also absorbs sunlight. And when it absorbs sunlight, it acts to heat the climate system. It is unique, really, among uh, the short-lived climate pollutants is that it's, it, it, it absorbs sunlight so strongly that it can, ha it can heat the climate locally mm -hmm. and, um, and to an appreciable degree. And it also decreases crop productivity. So there are, there are multiple reasons why soot really, we need to take soot out of the system. There are no benefits from having it in and a lot of benefits from taking it out. And primary sources of soot are? Uh, two primary sources, and for, uh, both of them related to combustion, so fossil fuel combustion, and also biomass burning for cooking, for example. Um, every evening uh, in Southeast Asia and India, 200 million people boot up fires in their homes made, uh, and for very good reason, this is the only way they have to cook. But they're, they're, they have very inefficient combustion that's producing a lot of soot. Uh, they have to do this in order to feed their families, but it is a, it's a major source of soot pollution. The good news here uh, is that soot has a very short lifetime in the Earth's atmosphere. So if we got a, a handle on it, on both the combustion, so on the combustion sources from fossil fuel combustion and from cooking, it lasts in the Earth's atmosphere for about a week. So we can take it out of the climate system just, to, just as quickly as we put it in. Okay. Now methane. Yes. Pernicious methane. Pernicious methane. Um, man is now the major source of methane in the climate system. We outrank natural sources by a factor of two to one. Uh, the two dominant sources of methane in the climate system and from, from man are, again, from fossil fuel production, production recovery, for example, from coal mines, and from agricultural activities. Again, fortunately, methane has a relatively short lifetime in the Earth's climate system. It's less than a decade. And we're starting to see concerted action in the United States. Uh, the 
Uh, President Obama has made it a, a central tenet of his climate action plan to get a handle on methane sources. Um, and we've also seen action in Asia and around the world in trying to get a handle on this problem. Japan is experimenting with rice paddies, for example, that emit much less methane than traditional mm -hmm. uh, inundated rice paddies. So countries around the world are really facing this issue very squarely. How does it rate with carbon in terms of its intense damage that it does? So methane is about, in terms of its total impact on how much we've changed the Earth's greenhouse effect, it has a, it's a third as big as carbon dioxide. But the problem is that it's 30 times more effective pound for pound than CO2 as a greenhouse gas. So you know, in, the, in this country, we're really touting uh, green, you know, methane and natural gas as a, as a wonderful source. It is wonderful. It produces half as much carbon dioxide uh, as uh, per BTU as coal. So that's wonderful. If you, th that's a great advantage relative to coal. But, but because of this 30, time, 30 times fold intensity of its greenhouse effect, you cannot tolerate leaks in the system. And the US has built a, 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 an energy infrastructure around recovering and delivering natural gas that is highly leaky and is very, very poorly characterized. And uh, we now know, thanks to measurements made in part at Berkeley Lab, that there's twice as much methane being emitted over the United States as EPA claimed. This is, and this is despite the fact that EPA has been very hard at work at this problem. So twice, should, twice. Twice. And we should be very grateful to EPA for having tried to characterize it, but there's twice as much there as they thought. And what role does fracking play in the methane situation? Uh, well, um, it's, we've literally reinvented the Wild West. Um, but this time around, the, the gun that's facing us is not, it's a loaded gun, but it's a loaded gun uh, that involves natural gas. And I, I think we have to get a handle around the leaky sources um, of the, the methane and the, the very leaky delivery system, because otherwise the benefits from, uh, from natural gas are largely offset by these leaks into the Earth's climate system. Let's, let's just look at what happened when in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Los Angeles had a, a leak that equaled uh, essentially all the cars on the streets of Los Angeles during the, the period when that leak was active. And this is a leak from one, from one single reservoir of natural gas. So that, that sort of sets the scale of the problem for you. And on that happy note, we're going to end the second segment. Yeah. Right, so that, that, the capability of modeling that methane has been coming online, we, we did a lot of research on that at Berkeley Lab. I'm proud to say that we were the first group to build a, a fully prognostic or predictive methane cycle for use in climate models. Uh, the challenge there is um, that th there's a huge amount of carbon stored in permafrost. It's 10 million square kilometers of frozen soil up around the Arctic Circle. Uh, According to certain estimates, twice as much carbon locked up in that permafrost as there is in the Earth's atmosphere. So the critical question is, how does that methane come out? As carbon dioxide or as methane? One thing, uh, so there are a number of groups worldwide that are now measuring this. I am happy to say that the measurements suggest that the majority of that, uh, when the permafrost thaws, the majority of that carbon is coming out as carbon dioxide, not as methane. But it's still an issue. Uh, and the, um, it, it's something that the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation and actually all the member countries in the Arctic Council are hard at work trying to solve. And we are bringing those capabilities online in the climate model. So that's, that's becoming a, a real life capability now. But excellent question. Live? Okay. Uh, hey.